Hi everyone! It's Saturday morning. It's Saturday morning. I'm on about a minute early so we can get this tablet set up. And I can see everybody's comments. My name is Leslie Onstead. I'm the creator of Color Art Products and I am your host of Color Play Live three days a week. Tuesdays and Fridays at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, and I'm here on Saturdays at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, and it is 9 a.m. right now. So uh, let me get ourselves our tablet set up so I can see everybody's comments as they come in. Welcome, welcome. Hope you're enjoying some gorgeous spring weather out there. It is definitely rocking and rolling here. I mean, it's still really, really cold in the morning, but it does finally get, I think they're claiming 70 degrees by four o'clock in the afternoon. Hi, someone that just came on. Say hello, who's here? Welcome, welcome, who's in the room? <laughs> I'm just getting the tablet set up here if you just came in. So we can get on and see everybody. Yeah, I don't need to. Play that, go to the channel. Hi, we, hey, John. Hi, Cindy. Nice to see you guys. Woohoo. Let's see if it lets me in. It always makes me look at a commercial. Here we go. We got Cindy, Sherry Ellis, Kathleen Mefford, John N., Kathleen McGee. So, Kathleen, no more court stuff this morning, right? No court stuff that we have to worry about. I know you were really busy yesterday with some stuff for your sweet girl, right? Some kind of thing that they needed from you. Saskia's here. Let's, we're doing a little roll call. So I have something different for you guys today. Uh-oh. Why did my Android just shut you guys down? Now I can't see anybody. Give me a minute. Why it's doing that, I don't know. Because it doesn't work if I can't talk to you. Okay, why is it not letting me go to YouTube? This is not cool, especially today, because we're going to actually have um, some class stuff happening. And... I'm going to need to see your answers. We are literally going to have a little class today. But as you can see, this thing just keeps. Oh, good. The judge was happy. That's fantastic. Okay. And he should be happy. You guys are doing a great job with her. I mean, she's amazing. She's confident. She's beautiful. Hey, Sandy Sanders. Your ears must be burning. I was just talking about you last night to somebody. How well you're doing with that jasmineite, right? Okay, let's see if this tablet holds up because it's never really kicked me out. I see Michelle D is also here. <laughs> yeah, I had to sign in to see, I had to, my, uh, my setup got a little weird here. Okay, so those of you that missed my swipe yesterday, bad children. Do I have paint on my nose? I wouldn't surprise me. I had to clean off the turntable and get my piece off so I could reset the table. I barely got on in time with one minute to spare. We're lucky we even have lips on. No eyebrows today. This is on natural on a Saturday morning, just like as if you came over to my house and we were going to sit back and drink a cup of coffee together, right? So uh, we're going to look at what we did yesterday. I'm thrilled with how it dried. It's not completely dry, but we did a Nautilus swipe. And uh, the colors that I used, I will put them out here as long as I can get room on my table here to manipulate all this stuff. Sherry Ellis had kind of inspired yesterday's color combination. So what I did is I took some of the, I'm going to put my camera over here for a little bit. I took some of our Titan Teal, the Vivid Intense Titan Teal. Hey, Scarlett, how are you guys? I'm just recapping for those that didn't see yesterday's. So I put some Titan Teal, um, probably about a, 
I ended up figuring out I might have put a quarter teaspoon, so I had to fill this thing up with paint, okay? Yeah, I know, there's paint everywhere, okay? And I cleaned this table up. I just spent the last hour cleaning up this tabletop to get the white off. So yesterday's color was Vivid Intense Titan Teal. Uh, I put some Dancing Fuchsia to get a pink. I had Snapdragon in here. We did a combination of the Purely Pigments um, Aztec Yellow. I remembered the name of it. I'm so proud of myself. And one of the electric oranges to get this color. And uh, I ended up making a custom cell activator, which I promise I will use. I saved all this yesterday. And then I made a beautiful interference sparkle combination of interference gold and the sparkle violet, which, wow, if you just turn it just right, see the little purple sparkles sparkling on the bottom of the container. If you're ever wondering what your mix is, you can kind of see it if you get it in the right light. Okay, so yesterday's piece I was pretty thrilled with. I wasn't so sure, but then I stopped just to be sure I didn't screw it up. Okay, now I'm going to do my best. It's still a little bit moist, okay? I've got it sitting on a piece of tissue paper here. Look at this. Now parts of it's dry. I can, part of that part is dry, but here in the center where you can see the paint still shiny, you know it's still wet. But look at the beautiful gold cells and all those little ghosty cells that popped up. I know I'm real excited about this. This part's already dry. And boy, look, you can see what this is gonna look like under resin, but this section right here in the middle is still really wet. I couldn't touch it. I mean, I just couldn't touch it. But what I mentioned yesterday to you guys, and I want you to think about how I laid the colors down. I laid the colors down with, I put the Titan Teal first, which is technically a turquoise on the green shade side. Then I laid down the Snapdragon. Now look what happened where the Snapdragon and the Titan Teal mixed. See how it gave us almost a blue? Now when you turn it, you're gonna see the purple cast, but laying this way, this is more blue because it picked up some of the blue. Yeah, this was yesterday and it's up. You can watch it, right? So you can see how we're, when the purple ran into the turquoise, it made what they call a tertiary color. That is such a technical term. But it's a combination of what happens when the turquoise mixed with the purple here, and it made that blue, okay? And then the purple, I laid down the Snapdragon. This color, right? I laid this color down next to the pink the dancing fuchsia. But where the two mixed, it made another secondary tertiary color here where they mixed, right? And now you can actually see the pink. And then where the pink mixed with, you know where I'm going with this, with this orangey yellow, right? You can see how much yellow is in here, what happens when it's spun out. I mean, most of the color in there was this Aztec yellow purely pigment. And there was only two drops in the cup but look how strong it was when it went around. But as that yellow, my point is when the yellow, this yellow orange mixed with this pink, look what it did. It kind of made a red orange color here where it mixed. Not quite red, but a lot of a red orange, okay? So I laid them in that pattern so when they ran into one another, they would automatically create kind of a secondary color effect. And also I wanted to make sure that, now it's not necessary. I've seen lots of beautiful blooms and swipes where they're putting green one on top of red. But if you notice the prettier ones, the green will have almost a turquoise effect and the red will almost have a pink effect. We'll get into this more when I'm mixing them. And they have a common denominator, right? And the common denominator between them was the purple shares, it's made out of red and blue, so it shares the common denominator of the red, 
There's a purpose of why I'm doing this with you guys and making you listen to what I'm saying here. And yes, there'll be a pop quiz afterwards, but I wanted to share the common denominator. When you're making purple, it's made out of red and blue. If you're making a red violet, hello, it's mostly red with a little bit of blue. So the red is the common denominator in here. And so when they run together, it's obvious. Same thing here. This has is a red violet. Well, this has, it may be a yellow, but as it warms up and gets more orange, how do you make orange? Red and yellow. So there's a red common denominator in the two of these. And so when they blend in together like that, you automatically get, and I know this is probably the perfect piece for Mandy because she's always picking colors to try to create a rainbow effect, right? And then again, I've got to be really careful because it's on this tissue because it's still wet. I I did use a whole lot of that interference gold to violet. And I think this is going to be really gorgeous when it gets resined. I wanted to do another one right away this morning. But then I thought, you know, I thought a little bit better about that uh, because uh, I just realized this was... Saturday morning, no makeup, lips only. I barely had time to get my table cleaned up. I took it, like I said, I took an hour getting all this paint off and resetting this table up clean. So, good morning, Dee. How are you doing, sweetheart? Miss Dee Lee is in the house. So, uh, what was the point of that little exercise we went through? Well, uh, like I said, I promised you guys color mixing, and sure, it's a it's a ton of fun to take a that Aztec yellow and add some interference violet and watch your eyes kind of pop and go, wow, what was she thinking when she did that? But what was I thinking when I did that? Well, technically yellow is a direct compliment to violet. Thank you, John. Thank you for telling me I look fabulous. Yes, and I am covered with paint. Did I get that paint off my nose yet? I know I have white paint on my nose. Sorry about that, guys. Hi there, Joan. How are you doing, sweetheart? And how's the weather in Missouri? So uh, yellow is a complement to purple, okay? So if I put violet, which is basically another word for purple, in the yellow, there's going to be a little shifty contrast. doesn't happen all the time, but in that particular situation, it worked. So I think today... I plan on doing some basic, basic, basic explanation of colors, color mixing. If you've already heard all this, I apologize in advance, but I think we're going to get to the very basics. So as we expand and then possibly if I can figure out how to do a Zoom class, um, where we can dig in further into color mixing so you understand how they work. It's not just about putting the beautiful minerals in the colors and making them sparkle, which of course I love to do. There's no doubt I love to do that. You're listening to me ooh and ah all the time on camera when I'm doing this. But there's, I wanna dig deeper, okay? So let's start with color. Now, anybody out there tell me, what your three primary colors are. No, this is not a test. You're not gonna get a grade on this. What are the three primary colors that are out there? Please, someone speak up and help me with some interaction here. Yellow, red, and blue. Thank you, Catherine Mefford. Yep, yellow, red, and blue. Okay, now, do you also know that yellow, red, and blue there's a computer across town with this company that actually makes fabric paint and paints for a living. Thank you. Everybody's responding, red, blue, and yellow. Thank you. We know our basic, basic. But did you know that they can make 2.1 million colors out of yellow, red, and blue? That's million with an M, okay? So that means if we're looking at a color wheel, and the color wheel is going to have your yellow, red, and blue, your primary. And then your secondary colors is what happens is when you mix your yellow and red together to make your orange, you mix your yellow and blue to make a green, 
and you mix your red and blue to make a purple. Those are considered your secondary colors, okay? Now, I'm gonna keep going back and forth in the camera to make my point, but for everybody who's brand new and doesn't know all this stuff, okay, I'm gonna paint these basic color cards. I know you said you already know this, but this is gonna really help when we get to the compliments. This is an 80 weight linen cardstock. Uh, it's a little bit easier to paint on than a mixed media paper and not quite as strong as a watercolor paper. Now the closest thing I can get you to a pure yellow in our purely pigment line right now, and the goal is to give you a complete 48 color Crayola crayon box, eventually when it's out, right? So the closest one we have, I think, because I can't call this Hansa yellow. We're calling it mellow yellow, but it is basically a clean Hansa yellow, a bright, clean yellow. No about it, about to doubt it. I don't see any orange in this. I don't see any green in this. I see just the perfect bright yellow. So the mellow yellow in your purely pigments is basically what you would also translate to say a Hansa, just a pure, clean yellow, okay? Yes, there is a purpose to this exercise, I promise you guys, okay? And it is a way, it is amazing that they can make 2.1 million colors out of these three. Now, this color call is called Holly Berry. It, is, it, it looks a little orange to me in the bottle, but it turned out that it's actually not. And it is a pure quinacridone red. Okay, I'm gonna do a nice little, I'm not trying to paint this like a watercolor. I'm just trying to get a really nice bright card of pure color here. So you get the idea of the red, all right? That is red. Let's add a little tiny bit of water to this thing to get it to spread out. By the way, uh, she's not in here, but Michelle Markey, when she's painting on black fabric at the quilt shows, she remarked she couldn't believe how gorgeous this red was painted on the black. I believe she did use it straight because we all know from painting with, you know, black on, red on black, it's almost possible to get yellow and black, I mean yellow and red to show up on black. Okay, so there's basically your red. This is a blue, now we're calling it azure blue. This is a pure fallow blue. Well, what's interesting is we're looking at the purest color. You can see a little bit of a weird cast to it as it dries. That's just the pure color base as it comes out. This is a good sign that you're working with pure color. That's the name, purely pigments. There's not a bunch of fall draw in there. Hope my brush is, doesn't have any yellow left on this thing because I don't want to make a green right off the bat. And then this is your fallow blue, okay? Now, I don't know about you guys because I don't know your age, but when I was a kid, the toys we had for us, we weren't playing with mom's cell phone, <laughs> okay? We had... Uh, a wooden block that had a, a square, a square, a square panel that had like the round yellow piece, a triangle in red, and uh, the square might have been in blue. They had these different shapes. Okay, so when we mix the, and and so I think they were trying to teach us our shapes and our colors at the same time when we had those toys. I thought that was kind of brilliant okay so um i'm going to pick a different orange even though yellow and red makes orange right so we put these two together it makes an orange in the purely pigment line i've got a choice to show you electric orange this is like really what a pure orange would look like you know like an orange we peel off the tree the saffron has more red in it so it goes into the red or orange. Now I could mix these together for you. The beautiful thing about these color suppliers, they make it so easy for us smaller paint manufacturers 
because they've actually mixed like the perfect orange for us, okay? But just so I'm proving my point here, and I know it's not perfectly accurate because the one drop coming out of the red may not have the identical amount of perfect liquid in there, perfect amount, as let's say the yellow. But if I try to put one drop of each in there, right, in theory, it's going to make me an orange. Granted, it looks like more of the saffron orange because that red is pretty strong. So if you were trying to make an orange out of this, you'd say, okay, how much yellow do I need? Because that still looks pretty darn red to me. So let's see what happens when we put a second drop of yellow in there. I want to make sure that, to be fair, to make sure the tip of my brush has got nothing to taint it. And the more yellow you add, the more you're going to get to eventually this color, okay? This is a couple shades off. If I had to guess, this is pretty close to the saffron. Let's see what we got here. What blocks? I do remember the blocks. I remember those little blocks when I was a kid. You managed to paint department, Lee? D? Oh my God. Now you may say, this looks awfully red. This looks awfully red. But if you put them close enough, we are getting to orange. So in theory, we would need more yellow, still more yellow. To get to that orange peel orange, I just put three drops in there. To get to that orange peel orange, yeah, we played with those as kids incessantly. Now look at that. Look at what color we just got. I put almost four drops of yellow in here with what red was left, right? And look at the difference in the color by adding three more drops of my yellow, okay? Now you can see that this is the orange, this is the red, but definitely put on a separate piece of paper a little bit of water because remember these are just pure pigments definitely you're getting an orange okay but for the sake of doing our color wheel there's a purpose of today's exercise i'm going to take a little bit of creative license here i've made a close enough color to my electric orange So we consider orange a mix of what? Yellow and red, right? Okay, pretty simple. People think, oh, it's too simple, Leslie. What are you trying to explain to us? Now, fortunately for us, these color manufacturers, they made a beautiful orange. So I don't have to measure every single time to try to get the perfect orange when I make a color for you. I'm in luck. This is a color that I can turn right around and not have to mix for you, okay? So that's our first color combination. Now what happens if I take my blue and my yellow, okay? Same situation, yellow and blue. Am I gonna be able to make like the perfect green? Well, let's see. If I had to guess, I would need more yellow than blue to get to the green that I'm looking for. But to start right off the bat, because you guys need to see how concentrated these are. It ended up being one, two, three, four, five drops of this to one drop of that holly berry to get that red. And I'd even taken some of the red out, I mean, to get this orange. I had taken some of the red out, okay? So let's uh, put this yellow in here. That's two drops of yellow. I'll go three drops of yellow. See if I can save a little time here. And I'm just gonna put one drop of the azure blue, which is our fallow blue. Okay. 
Just one single drop. Yeah, it sure looks green in that little spot there. See how it formed a perfect little green spot there in the middle of it? Now this end of this brush has some orange on it. I can't use that. You need to make special little tools that are just like the ends of the paint brushes, something we can mix without. Okay, so that's not a bad green. But see how strong that blue is? I keep mixing it in. It keeps getting greener and greener and greener. Okay. That was three yellow to one blue. That's crazy. Now, let's see how that works towards on our paper. I'm going to grab some of this. It's more of an earthy green. I call an earthy green because it looks more like a green you'd find in nature. It's not that perfect Kelly green or Irish luck green or even the chartreuse green, right? This is a variation and it's more of an earthy green. And yet we are fortunate, again, that the companies give us, that's vibrant aqua. Where is my green? There's black plum. Here we go. Perfect peacock. So this is fallow green. Perfect peacock is actually made with a color called fallow green. So the companies actually will make us uh, make the green for us. God, everybody's so quiet. I think, I hope it's because we're all focusing on what the teacher's saying. I know, I know, I know. I get nervous when I don't hear from anybody. Let's get the yellow and red over here where it belongs with these colors, okay. Oh, that's right, we're doing this exercise here. Yellow, blue. So the fallow green is a gorgeous color. I mean, I could try all day long to try to make the perfect fallow green, but trust me, I don't mind at all jumping to the end of the game here and having the perfect green made for me. Okay. Now look at that green. It almost looks unreal. Not quite what nature gives us. But it's a perfect basis for stemming off and making all kinds of other colors that you want to make. It, it's interesting how the fallow green, to me, borders so closely to a turquoise. I mean, granted, it's a green. There's no doubt. It is a green. I make a lot of green paints off of this. But what you want to do is you add a nuance of a little bit of yellow. I'm not going to mess with our swatch here. But a nuance of yellow... And I'm just going to add it right here. I'll add the green to the fallow, the yellow to the fallow green. So now I've got some yellow, yellow, fallow green mixed together. Look at that crazy, crazy, perfect Irish green. So, you know, rather than try to make the green from scratch every time, unless you've got that computer that can bake 2.1 million colors in an instant, it's pretty handy having the pure fallow at your fingertips, right? So we've got yellow and orange, yellow and red makes the orange, yellow and blue makes the green. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Hi, Shannon. What do you just, just, yes, ma'am, and is for? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Welcome to the, welcome to our little class here. Okay. So if I want to make a purple, let's move this over here a little bit. Technically, now this would be the toughest one for us to craft by hand because it ain't easy. Let's get these. 
You know me, I want it tidy. Last thing I want to do is drop a bottle over the top of everything. Okay, so if I wanted to make a purple, in theory, I would use phthalo blue, quinacridine red, okay, which is what the hollyberry is, mix it together to make a purple. So there's my blue, there's my red to make a purple. Can I tell you, this is probably one of the hardest colors to try to mix. There's a reason why paint manufacturers buy, purchase outright the perfect purple or violet. And we also will buy the red violet. Okay, and we're gonna get into a minute and explain what the red violet, what the difference is. So if I wanted to try to hand mix this, yeah, these are very strong because they're just the pure color that the manufacturer sells us with just enough carrier in it to get it to flow. So I'm gonna try one drop of red, one drop of blue. Now, in this case, I'm gonna explain the whole fallow thing in a minute. In this case, if I had to make a purple, I would have used fallow blue red shade. They actually give that to us, but I think mentioning it right now is a little premature but I want to open up that door to explain this. So see, if I was trying to make a custom purple, it almost comes out dirty, right? Am I really going to get a true purple? This red is pretty warm, and it's just a basic fallow blue. So what am I going to get? I know it looks black, but as we add a little bit more water to this, see how strong that fallow blue is? It's basically taking over any red that's in there. Let me see if I can get another little more water on this. That was pretty strong. So you're not really gonna get a purple per se. You're gonna get kind of this smoky color. You can see the red in there, but that fallow blue is so darn strong, it wants to dominate everything. So there's a reason why manufacturers will jump right into what you guys know is diazazine. Wait a minute, that's the wrong color. Good thing I didn't use that one. That was the green for this. That's a perfect peacock. That's that fellow green. There's a reason why we will put the money out to buy that purple, okay? It's still going to look black. There's a reason why this is called Black Plum. It inspired it because when I saw this in the bottle, I'm like, dang, that looks black. It almost Then when you turn it to side, you almost see this weird green cast. That's just the chemical that they use to process the color. Because color is in a dry form. When it's mined out of the ground, it's dry. But see how strong this purple is? I mean, it's really strong. You have to keep thinning it down, thinning it down, thinning it down, thinning it down to pull out the violet. You don't need much at all to get that purple. So this is that black plum. Okay, now uh, real quick, just so we can accentuate what I mean by 2.1 million colors. Okay, so if yellow, red, let's say yellow, red, and blue, like the triangle, make 2.1 million, and between the yellow, I've gotta go this direction, I think I have to go this direction for you guys, between the yellow and the red, which is down here, you've got all your variations to orange to get to red, right? When you get your red going to blue, you got all your variations of red, red, violet, red, violet, all the variations till you get to the blue. And then you got all your variations to get back up into that yellow again that makes that green. So if you think about it, that's 350,000 colors of all six. If it's 2.1 million divided by six, that's 350,000 combination of colors for each one of those sections. And 75, 350,000 colors going from yellow to orange, okay? Now, how do we divide that up even more? 
Well, if you start looking at the colors around the room you're in, if you're driving the car like Terry Lechner mostly likely is, she's always driving when she's on, she may have to look at a car that she's passing by. But uh, start thinking of colors in two tones, a dominant and a non-dominant. Now, what does that mean? Okay, so if I was gonna make a yellow and I wanted to add a little red to it to warm it up, and that's kind of, that's that never made sense to me because yellow was a warm color anyway, but to warm up a yellow, they'll add red. To cool down a yellow, they'll add blue. This is technically a yellow orange, right? Is the yellow the dominant color that you see in here or is it an orange? Because what happens is in the pie slices, you'll go from yellow, yellow, orange, yellow, orange, yellow, orange. Technically, it just looks like a warmer yellow, yellow, orange, yellow, orange, all the way to the orange. And then you got yellow, yellow, orange, orange, yellow, orange, yellow, orange, yellow, orange, yellow, orange, orange, yellow till you get to the orange. Then you have your orange going to red as it goes farther down the reel, but then it turns into a red orange. So you've got orange, red, red, orange. Now you've got 175,000 colors in each one of those individual pie slices. When I'm looking at a, a color wheel, I like to make 18 variations. We tried to educate people that when we did the master set on the primary elements, we put them in yellow, green, yellow, orange, yellow. We tried to teach while we were doing that and I don't know if it landed like a big flat bomb or not. But when you start looking at color, there's very few in the world that are actually just a pure yellow, red, and blue. Very few, technically three out of 2.1 million. Okay. So why am I trying to get this impress this upon you? Because this is where you're gonna find your common denominators, where you're gonna find colors that blend together, or where you also find colors that contrast. Now, what do I mean by contrast? They're colors that complement. Contrast is a little bit of a technical term. Complement just means they look pretty together. They make each other pop, okay? Technically, Yellow and purple are complements. They're opposite on the color wheel, okay? And your green and red, they're opposite on the color wheel. They're complements. And your orange and blue. And by the way, orange and blue is the most used combination of complements. If you watch any of those late night TV shows, check out the sets. They're using lots of warm browns, mahoganies, along with blue lighting, because this is considered the most comfortable combination for your eye to see. This, there's a vibration that happens when complementary colors are next to one another. This is the next most way your eyes gets excited. And there's even a, a place out on the internet that tells you just how much purple and blue to put together. Uh, I mean, purple and yellow to put together so the vibrations are not too much for the eye to handle. But how do you remember what's a compliment? You could write it down and try to memorize it. I will say that I would memorize it. I had to memorize it, but memorizing it is uh, the best thing you can do. It's like just doing our times tables. You need to know the complement to the red is the green. You need to know that the complement to the purple is the yellow, okay? You just end up memorizing it. But here's a little trick I thought was kind of interesting, and I'm gonna show you on camera, okay? Remember we used yellow and red to make orange, right? All right? What's interesting is the complement to orange is the only primary color we didn't use to make this up. So you're gonna use two primaries to make the orange and the complement to the other primary is the combination of the two mixed together. It's the blue, okay? Same thing when you're doing your 
yellow and blue makes green, right? What's the one primary color I didn't use when making the green? Come on, John, somebody speak up. Sherry Ellis, Kathleen Mefford. If I used yellow and blue to make this green, yes, red is the, yes, red is the primary I didn't use. And technically red is the complement to green. Same thing with the blue and red made purple, right? And the only primary we didn't use to make the purple was, yes, yellow. Now, I think Michelle D has a little bit of an edge because I think I went through this with over the phone. I said, here's a little trick how to remember your compliments, okay? And why does that matter? Well, sometimes that matters in the composition or the colors you're putting together. Uh, years ago, I did this little book called The Colors of Radiance, and I was trying to, which by the way, I found a copy of it for 50 bucks on eBay. I think it was eBay or Etsy, which I'm thinking about taking the content of that book, recording it, and creating some kind of class out of it. But the book went through the relationships of the colors, like I just explained to you, uh, how you make your different browns, whether it's a warm brown or a red brown or a cool brown. And then there was an exercise with four different daisies. I know people are commenting, but I have my glasses off, so I can't see what anybody's saying right now, and I want to make this point. So the part of the book, I had a daisy stamped four different ways. Uh, the daisy was yellow, and I showed a daisy on a, a yellow daisy on like a yellow orange background on a violet blue background. I showed it on different backgrounds to show what compliments. And I remember this woman, what inspired this page in the book was a woman coming up to me in the class. And she said, I painted my flower the same way as yours. Why is it not that pretty? And it, it wasn't the technical way she painted it. It wasn't if she colored outside of the lines, okay? Her mind knew something wasn't the same, but her brain did not engage. She didn't realize she was using a yellow flower in the front with basically a yellow-orange background. Nothing to complement it. But if she put a violet background to, uh, I mean, the uh, violet background to the yellow daisy in the front, it popped. She couldn't see that. When she came up, she could not see why did mine look better than yours. Her brain saw it, but her head didn't pick it up. I had to explain compliments to her. I said, see, this is a complimentary color. See how the purple pops against that yellow. So I want to leave you guys today, I mean, we're not done by any means, but I want to plant this seed in you. Start looking at the colors in your world around you. I do it all the time. I'm walking around, oh, that's a yellow green. Oh no, that's a green yellow. Which is the dominant? Does it look to you like it's more yellow? Or does it look like it's more green in that green yellow or yellow green? Eventually you'll come right in the center <laughs> you won't see any dominant, and then you know you found that perfect centered green, okay? Out of the 175,000 of those individuals, little pie slices going around there, that's a lot of combinations. So if you start thinking about your colors in dominant to non-dominant, it'll help you uh, have more, exercise more power in what colors complement. Yes, on the class, please. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out. I've never done a Zoom class. I've heard they're very wildly successful. Uh, I might even do the first intro. And again, it's in the middle of the thing. Everybody's here. So I'm going to do a little bit of business right here, right now. Uh, 
we are still trying to raise capital so we can reorganize the warehouses and expand, okay? And uh, in order to make an effort for that, last week we did the stock up 40. We had that special code. Thank you everybody who joined in and helped us. Well, we're taking it a step further. We're creating these VIP, whatever we want to call it, member uh gift card codes. I'm going to have a window open for about 10 days. You can come in and get a $500 gift card for 41% off or a $750 gift card for 42% off or a $1,000 gift card for 43% off. Now it may seem weird, but there are people that want the new watercolors, want the new things that we're making. They don't want to feel rushed that they've got to go in and pick something out for 40% off right now because the thing's going to go off sale. They don't want the pressure. And as part of the perks, uh, now when I'm working on anything new, this group, it might be only 25 people. You guys are going to be no first when I'm working on something new. You're always going to end up on the sampler list. Not once in a while a sampler. Your names will be on a regular list of sampling products or sample colors that go out. Many times we'll pour a primary element and, uh, fun fact, hard plastic breathes. And if for some reason it's reduced in the jar because the moisture in your jar has gone down, it looks like it's half full. And so every once in a while, you guys, it might have already happened to you, you'll get an order in a little jar and say, enjoy this little extra jar of something. I have people message me going, your uh, crew made a mistake. They sent me something I didn't buy. And I have to say, well, that's, you know, a little sample that they sent you. But uh, we're going to do a sampling program. Now, I know for a fact I got four big boxes sitting in my hallway of prison pour colors that I was experimenting with when I... Uh, was first re doing the relaunch of the prison pour in these archival color bases. And I was so determined to make the perfect combination of a nickel as a gold to a butternut squash center. And I've got boxes of those things. So it would give me a place to send to our members. Uh, I don't know, you might get three or four bottles in, in your box. So it's uh, it's just an option that's up there. It's going to help us grow. It's going to help us bring back the watercolor line. So uh, I just wanted to do a brief little explanation while everybody's in here. And then the third part of this, I know we can do a private uh, YouTube live like this, but I would like to actually offer some kind of uh, class time. Now, if somebody wants to go deeper, I'm considering doing one for a $2,200 gift card for an $1,100 in literally 50% off. And uh, obviously, uh, Sandy Sanders and I spent an hour of FaceTime on the phone. I'd be happy to help somebody walk them through with their consistency, their colors, their mixing, their challenges that they're having. Anything we can do to give you guys perks and I think I'm going to do this window once a year. Now, eight years ago, we did a GoFundMe. We actually went did a GoFundMe, and we uh, 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 raised the capital to move where we're at right now. And GoFundMe doesn't really like existing businesses to do that. So this is kind of our version of a GoFundMe, uh, in, staying in-house, uh, the one we did before, you had to buy a specific set. Like we had three different versions of our watercolor sets, three different versions of primary element sets, but you actually had to buy something on the spot that you wanted to, to participate in the GoFundMe. So uh, this idea sort of stemmed from Fairy Art Mother. She said, I'd rather have a gift card that I can buy stuff in the future than be forced to use a code right now. So anyway, it's up on the Color Play Deals page. And you guys, yeah, Sandy, I had a blast. Sandy Sanders and I FaceTime all about the whole jasmineite and how the purely pigments wasn't coming off in the jasmineite, right? So, okay, let's get back to the color thing. So when I was showing you my piece that I swiped, I talked to you about colors that have a common denominator. They can kiss. I call them kissing cousins, okay? So in theory, in theory... I should be able to 
take a yellow and a green and a blue and a purple and a violet and orange and get right back to there again. I mean, there's our six, right? When I was at trade shows, I used to do all these trade shows with the Twinkling H2Os. I would show people how I could use one brush, not have to clean it. And I know this is nuts because I can't believe I'm doing this live on camera. <laughs> Anything can go wrong live on camera, right? But it shows the how if they're laid next to one another, I mean, look at this. You can automatically see how they're all going to blend, right? They belong next to one another. They all have a relationship. I know I'm about to make my table real messy because I sprayed these things. Let's see if I can fit them all on here. We need a little bit more blue in that majestic blue. See, I'm going to run off the table here. There's not going to be room. I'm going to put these other ones in the back. I only picked a dozen colors as I was trying to get ready for this bend. I panicked going, what if I pick the wrong colors? And so I think I picked way too many, in my humble opinion. But the test, this is the test. Let's get these guys up here. And again, I know I'm messing up my table. Just so be it. You guys are going to have to... To live <laughs> My butcher paper was so nice and clean, wasn't it? <laughs> Sorry, guys. That's okay. We can make this work. We can make this work. So, yeah. But see, you think about that. John just said something, and he's right. Look at the rainbow. If you think about a rainbow... I'm not liking how dirty this paper is already. I guess I'm going to put it on something else. Yes. Oh, Denise, you need to watch. Uh, even though I'm not going to say my project was fabulous. Yes. When the Purely Pigments was designed, like Denise asked a question, can she use Purely Pigments and resin? Obviously, Denise is somewhat new to our Saturday crew. That she may not know. I'm just putting water in these watercolor cakes. Absolutely. I designed them with uh, resin in mind because I, I wanted to... Um, sorry, guys. I'm trying to find the perfect paintbrush here to do this with. I want something a little bit fatter. Not something little. So it makes like a big brush stroke here. And my water's not exactly clean. Let me get some clean water here. Again, I think I'm going to put a third piece of paper on here. I do not like all that dirty water soaking up into my piece. They're beautiful. Okay, so I want to take some. Now, again, I don't have the perfect moisture in them, but I'm going to grab some of my yellow. So that's sunburst, right? Now, I'm wiping off the excess over here, but I'm not going to put my brush in the water. The exercise here, this is a color called Yellow Rose. And I'm simply just brushing off on the paper towel any excess water in here. I think this color is orange peel. They're really wet, so I can't really see them. But as you can see, the orange peel is going to blend nicely because you've got your yellow. They're going to a yellow orange. Now we're actually at a pure orange. Now, the only red I found was Vavum Red, but it's got a lot. Oh, my God, I washed the brush. I wasn't even thinking. What a dope. It's a habit to wash the brush, guys. Don't let me do it again. <laughs> That's right, Denise. Lots of questions. No, sweetheart. No, Denise, questions are good. We want lots of questions. I think this ended up being a deep coral because I couldn't find like poppy red or cinnamon red in my group. 
So this is an orange, and technically this would be a red orange. This, it's called deep coral, but it's kind of a red orange, right? Now I'm gonna wipe my brush right here. I'm not gonna put any more color on. Now I'm gonna try to jump to a pink right away. This is a color called apple blossom. Pinks and turquoises kind of uh, make the color real more interesting. <laughs> Hopefully we got enough water in these things. These are a gum arabic watercolor pot. I love the twinkling H2Os. Oh, come on. I knew I didn't have enough water in that apple blossom. And the coral is mixing into that apple blossom, but it's still compatible. I don't think I gave this long enough to wet up. Let me see if I can get some apple blossom stirred up here. Typically, I'll wet the cake, let it sit for about a half an hour, and then wet it again, and it'll form a creamy paste in the center, similar to a, a uh, paste out of a tube. I just want to get a real good hefty amount. I kind of blew it here with not having enough apple blossom for you guys to see. I'm sorry about that. But I know the next color is going to make up for it. Got plenty of orange on this brush still. I think this is jasmine. Yep, this is the jasmine. Now, why I'm putting the pinks in there is because if you're talking about a, a pure color wheel, yeah, they don't enter pink, but pink and turquoise is part of our world, isn't it? So we know the apple blossom, the pale pink, will do fine with the coral, right? This is the jasmine, and it doesn't look bad, actually, with some of these other colors in it. It's not as vibrant as you're used to seeing, but it's color. Now, this is Vavum Red. Now, Vavum Red, while it's got the name Red in the title, it's actually got a lot of violet in it. So this, to me, is a red violet. There's a lot of purple in it. Now, next to the jasmine... You can't really see that, but if you were trying to paint this and expected a hollyberry red, that is not hollyberry red. You can see that purple in that Vaboom red. So because we're at the end of that grouping here, I'm gonna go with Vaboom red here also. Let's get a little bit farther up here so we can get the Vaboom red here so you can see it. Right now without yeah, we're going to get everything in, honey, so you can make your own. Yeah, we will eventually. But we plan on also producing them. Okay, so now I'm jumping direct. This is a big leap to go from Vaboom Red to Snapdragon because Snapdragon's more middle of the road. I mean, it's like the perfect purple. But I'm going to go ahead and mix it right next to my Vaboom Red. I'm still okay with that. Now, there, had I put another one in the middle, it kind of wouldn't have gone so dark like that. Quite frankly, I could have gone Vaboom Red, then maybe a, a different type of Red Violet, and then the Red Violet would mix into the Snapdragon. But I think you guys are getting the whole point of this exercise. Next color would be Evening Primrose. This is considered a blue violet or actually as much purple as in there i'd call it a violet blue but there's still a common denominator between that snapdragon and getting to this evening primrose now there's enough blue in there i'm running out of paper towel to wipe my brush off of there's enough blue in that evening primrose to be able to make the stretch to the majestic blue are you guys seeing a pattern here? We're not making mud. Because there's a common denominator between these. Red, violet, and there is red in the snapdragon going to make that purple. Blue and red make the purple, and there's plenty of blue in that evening primrose, right? And then we get to the majestic blue, 
Now I'm going to leap, I think I'm leaping directly from majestic blue to a sky blue. So it's still a blue, but some of you might say, well, this is starting to look a little bit turquoise, sort of. That means there's just a touch of green in that blue to give it that shade, right? Where it's going up to that shade that you guys see. Sorry, I've got to make sure we're on camera here. So that's the sky blue. Now I can go right into another pot. You notice I'm not washing my brush out, guys, and I'm still not making mud. So I'm going to go straight down here. So I can go straight from that sky blue into a turquoise. And we know they're going to meld together where they mix. It almost looks like they belong next to one another on the color wheel, right? And then we got a color here. Let's see what we got here. That's Bolivian blue, a little bit darker. This is mystic blue, which should have a tiny bit more green to it. Yep. Can you see that? There's a little bit more green to the mystic blue than there is in the Bolivian. So technically this would be a blue green and this is getting to a green blue, right? I'm just gonna wash my brush off. I'm not washing it. I'm just wiping the excess paint off. This is pure blown Kelly green. I think this color is Irish mist. There's a key lime. Whoa, and lo and behold, if I clean my brush off well enough, I'm just getting the excess off. This still has plenty of green on the brush. Yes, it's gonna taint my pot, but I can go right back in here to this yellow. And add a yellow green. To it. I can put a little more water in here so I can wash up my pot. But I think you get the point of this exercise. Of course, now I've really made this pot, this yellow pot green. That's okay. You can rinse the whole thing off. See, I got a little bit. I rinsed it in the thingy and I'm going to wipe off the top. And now I'm getting back to my beautiful yellow again because I don't want to ruin this pot, right? But the whole point of this exercise is to show you that all these colors have a relationship. Oh, I love that bottom line. I love that bottom line. Now, these are watercolors, Denise, but they are made out of the primary elements. So if you hear me call out sunburst, you're gonna be familiar with a color called sunburst, right? Yeah, well, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, Any Lopez, I can't. I don't know your real name, so I'm just gonna call you Any. Any Lopez? You need to have some of these in this life? Well, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to raise the capital by doing this special VIP program, gift card program, so we can reorganize our factory and start making these. And boy, that bottom line just makes my heart go crazy. No, they're not an ink. I mean, you can think of them as an ink, but that's a good point. I'm glad you brought that up because I think I need to explain this to people. Let me get a regular two paint out there. You've opened up a window there, Saskia. And I think that's a good point for people get an idea of the saturation. Okay, so. Here's a regular tube uh, paint of uh, Amsterdam, right? And there's an Amsterdam tube paint. Sorry, I'm going to try to clean up while we're doing this. <laughs> Such a small little table here. Get these pots back in this little tray. These little trays are great because you can spray... I never, ever, ever put the tops back on my jars until I have to travel or go somewhere. 
because they're natural. There's no um, chemical in it to keep them, like there's no antifungal in there. I think the reason why I did that as a kid, I had a tendency to always put the paintbrush in my mouth to get a point. And so I don't put antifungals in there. These are made with simply gum arabic and color and a lot, a lot of sparkle. So, um, yeah, there's no antifungal in there. So I keep them, keep them well um, dried out. I leave the cap off. Okay, so I'm finding this mess a little bit distracting, so bear with me while I create a brand new set, right? Okay, so I want to give you guys some benchmarks. Now, I don't have an ink here. I normally will have an ink from some company. I do not. Um, damn it. I did have a little bottle of ink from some competitor up here, but I can't find it right now. So you're going to have to go with me and imagine there's a bottle of ink in the explanation of what I'm about to tell you guys. So this is pure magenta. Okay, so let's talk about the color bases. Because Saskia brought up a point, and she says, think of it as an ink, probably because it's a liquid, but it's not that liquidy. Okay, so color is the pure color that we're putting in the purely pigments is extremely strong. I think I'll get something that'll complement next to this. So it'll show up better on camera. Okay. But to give you a benchmark, a regular tube of acrylic paint, and this is 120 mils, so it's two ounces. There might be, and that's a big might, one to one and a half mils to an entire 120 mil tube. One to one and a half mils of color. Okay. It's not an ink, but it sure looks like one. It's like an ink. She's right. That, oh gosh, yes, 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 Denise, hear me out. So you've got maybe one and a half to two mils of color to 120 when you're buying a two paint. Now, step up to an ink. Let's just imagine this is an ink bottle. Here, I'll put a little white bottle down here, and we're going to pretend that this is ink, okay? You're at about one and a half mils for a 30 mil bottle. Okay, so versus one and a half for 120 mils, an ink is uh, one and a half mils to 30. Okay, now let's go to a fluid acrylic. And we're not the only ones out there to make a fluid acrylic. Hoblein makes it, Golden makes it, Matisse makes it. Many people are jumping on the bandwagon and make a fluid acrylic. They were considered at one time the most intense colors because benchmark... You've got three mils of color per ounce, Denise. So in this four ounce bottle, there's 12 mils of pure color to this four ounces compared to one and a half mils of color to this 120. And I, I know the numbers are confusing, but if there's 12 to the four ounces equal to equal, that means there's six mils of pure color to the 120 mils, and this is only one and a half. That's how pure these color bases are that we're getting from the manufacturer, okay? Now let's take a step up to purely pigments, okay? These are 30 mils, 25 mils, Denise, 25 mils. This is the pure color we use to make our paints with just enough carrier in it to get it to flow. And we did that so it's compatible with resin and acrylic. You can put this in anything. And now we know about the jesmonite, thanks to the lovely Sandy Sanders. So uh, this is like getting almost eight bottles of ink in one bottle. That's why we're only using one drop when we're mixing these crazy colors. And Denise, you did come in late, so you didn't get a chance to see the example of yesterday's swipe that we did with these beautiful colors. I just thought I'd show that one more time. But no, it's, it's good. I mean, the fact that you're asking these questions means that we're all learning something, okay? And uh, a dot, not even a drop, right? Now, I know that if, so far, what else we also know is so we've put some of this in um, a, a, like a white cell activator. You can customize your own cell activators. 
I have not actually made a cell activator just with this and Floetrol. I cheated <laughs> because my cell activator is made out of the Australian Floetrol and the Amsterdam White, right? So when I made this cell activator, all I had to do was put in a drop or two of my papaya to make this color. And when I say cheating, we know that Amsterdam Titanium White, even mixed with water, will give you cellage. So you definitely know. Bye, Pam. Thanks for joining us, sweetheart. Thank you. Have fun at your soccer game. So we know by adding Floetrol to the Amsterdam Titanium White, we're guaranteed we're going to get some beautiful cells, right? But the... the uh, the purely pigments, I know I can stain this color, but I have not yet tried to actually make just a, a cell activator from scratch out of them yet. We got a lot of different projects that, you know, we want to do. So uh, when you start thinking about your colors, again, look around the room you're in. Even the brown, it might be a cabinet that you've got on your wall or, or up against, well, I got lots of wooden cabinets with stuff stored in it. Is it a warm tone wood? Does it look like there's more yellow in it? Is it a red toned wood, kind of a cherry wood? Is it an, an umbery color? It looks like it's, it's dark and brown, almost kind of like our hickory brown. Like what shade is that in front of you? And I know I walk around and say, okay, I have a yellow orange. What is the complement to the yellow orange? Here's your pop quiz, kids. So using what I just showed you about complements and that the complement is always the primary that's not been mixed to make the color. For example, red and blue makes purple, and the only primary not used was yellow. Okay, so if I want to find the perfect complement to a yellow orange, yellow orange, by, I know I'm boring you now, Johnny. <laughs> okay. Sherry's got part of it, but what's the complement to the yellow? Thank you, John. What's the complement to the yellow? Okay, so when you think of a yellow orange, the complement to the yellow would be violet, right, purple, okay. And I have an orange that I need to find the complement, which would be a blue. So the true complement to a yellow orange is a violet blue. No, I, I'm trying to get you to think in two tones. Sheldon's favorite color, boysenberry. Almost, because that boysenberry does have a lot of blue in it. But it is a violet blue. Okay, so the complement to a yellow green. What's a complement to a yellow green? I hope so, because it, you know, it's a little technical. It's not me literally painting. Okay, no, yellow, green. Think of yellow, green. You've got two words. So what's a complement to the yellow? What's a complement to the green? Nope. What's the complement to the yellow? Yeah, Sheldon's right, but it's the other way around. It's a violet red. He's calling it red violet because so many people think of red violet. But the complement to the yellow would be purple, right? So let's put this behind it. And the complement to the green, right, would be the red. Now, most people call it red violet, but there is such a thing as a violet red and a red violet, a purple violet and a violet. <laughs> How do I say that? a violet red and a red violet. As you're going down that color wheel and all those 2.1 million pie slices, it's gonna change when you get down farther down the wheel, you're gonna go into the red and as it goes towards the purple, it's gonna be 
red, 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 violet, red, violet, red, violet, and then it starts changing to violet, blue, violet, blue, violet, blue, until it hits the blue part of the color wheel. So think of your compliments, because that's what's going to make your colors pop when you're playing, right? So in the purely pigments, what we did when we created them, yeah, everybody needs one, Sandy. Are you kidding? I do this all day long <laughs> for a living. And uh, I had the luxury of spending a lot of time on the road with this artist that her name was Kat Runge, fantastic lady. She was actually a professor of art and uh, she focused mostly on costume design. But we would sit in the hotel rooms and, and it was, we were traveling, going from show to show and do nothing but talk about color. What complements the color? So in this crayola the crayons that I've created you so far, you've got your, you know, your mellow yellow, and then you get your, this is technically to me still a yellow orange. Okay, we really haven't made an orange yellow yet. This was that Aztec yellow. And then we jump right to the orange, which is the electric orange. I think that's what that's called. Yeah, electric orange. Then we get right into saffron, which I did not bring that up, but the saffron is a red orange. It's a beautiful red orange. As a matter of fact, I think I got some more paper cut up here so you can see that. Yes, yes. When it depends completely on the yellow and the relationship to the green. Sheldon's correct. As you're going through all those pie slices, one little notch keeps moving around that wheel and you go from a bright yellow, let's say if blue's on this side, so you're gonna go yellow green to this end, and if orange is on this side, you're gonna go to the yellow orange to this end. He's correct. It's a lot to explain. I almost feel like I need to give some of you documentation in writing ahead of time. Now, in its purest form, you may not be yeah, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, Janelle. I think that's a good point we're going to leave off on because the blues we've gotten real lucky on. So I do have a color called saffron, which is going to give you this orange red. And it's much different than the actual... What did you say, Penny? What's on sale? Uh, not yet, Penny, but you know what? I'm going to probably put those up on Sunday because I, I realized this morning we had not put set two up in the individual, so you can't go and purchase, let's say, this Aztec yellow individually yet. They're only available in the set right now. We were waiting until we had all those sets that were pre-sold out the door because we had to wait for that second run of drawers to show up before we could ship. And you see now next to one another, you can tell that that's a regular orange to a red orange. So we've, we've, uh, we've tried to kind of fill in part of this wheel here. So we've got the yellow, the electric orange, we've got the saffron, then it jumps to what we're actually calling holly berry, actual red, right? Same thing with our yellow. Those are like the primaries. And then uh, for the fun of it, we actually have created a red-violet color. Which it goes, you need to have a red-violet. What did we call this? I forget what we called it on camera. It actually has a name in the set. Now I'm blanking. Somebody tell me what this color is in set two. I'm totally blanking. I gave it a cool name. I thought I did. <laughs> it's red violet. Now this is the pure red violet from the manufacturer. I did not make that. Completely different from the blue, and I call it, it's more of a true violet, but it looks like it's got more blue to it, okay? Now Janelle brought up a point of, and I wanna leave you guys with this, of what about the fallows. Okay, so, uh-oh, what did Sheldon say that we're learning here? 
So when you say blue, green, blue is the dominant. Yes, and green, blue, green is the dominant. He's nailing it. Sheldon nailed it. You're right. As you're getting into that teal section, you're going to go from blue, green, green, blue. And if you look at it, you can tell, okay, does that have more green or blue? It might depend on the eye with the cameras on. They've also used a, a mixing white to lighten this up. But this looks like it's just got a tad more green to it than blue to it to me. That's my eye. So if this was a blue-green, what's the complement to a blue-green? And I'll give you guys a minute to answer that. Fairy Art Mother loves her favorite color, aubergine. <laughs> but I think she posted that up before I asked the question. So what is the complement to a blue-green? I promise I'll stop these questions in a minute. And you guys, you're not put on the spot. There's no wrong answer. Okay, so no one said, there you go. No, close. The complement to a green-blue. Here's the green. Where's my little blue card? I can't find my blue card. The green-blue. Okay, the complement to the green. You thought, what was the other way around? Green was describing as if green was describing the blue. Yeah, no, think of dominant versus non-dominant. If I look at this, let me look at this color again. Here, I'll show you guys. This has a little bit more green to it than blue. And where's the swatch of the watercolor papers? This may also help here a little bit when I was doing these. See how this has a blue, more blue to it, a little bit less blue to it, and then it starts going into the green-blue. You can see how they all line up. And you are correct, green-blue is red-orange, right? So the complement to the green-blue is actually gonna be this color. This, these, this makes this pop. But I will say one thing that I, a slight sidestep, uh, one of the prettiest pieces I've seen is they use that really bright Chinese red and this green teal. They just pop, pop, pop into one another. All right, Janelle asked a question about fallow blues. And we are fortunate enough. I wish the color companies would break down colors for us a little bit further, but they don't. But we are lucky with the fallows. So we offer a... This is the green shade, and we offer a blue shade, a red shade. I'm just looking for the bottle, guys. Give me a minute. One of these is the, that's my green shade. This must be the red shade. Yep, red shade blue. Now in the bottle, you might see this one looks a little bit lighter, right? But this is fallow red shade, fallow blue shade. And I'm going to actually mix these up in a cup with a little bit of some varnish in here. I'll make a little paint and put a cap on I can use later on because I think you're going to get a better idea of the nuance with the red shade and the green shade if we do it this way. So I'm going to put a, I don't know, maybe a half a teaspoon of varnish in each one of these. This is the red shade blue. And we even on the label, we're calling them red shade blue so people don't get confused. So there's the red. Now, in theory, the red shade would seem, because we know that red and blue makes purple, right? So red shade blue would lean towards helping to make purples, right? See if we can get this this way here. And the green, blue, sorry, I'm trying to get my a clean brush here. I don't want any yellow on this thing. Last thing I want to do is taint this. May not look that much different in the cup. 
red shade blue. It's just mixed with straight varnish. And I'm gonna leave that brush there so I don't accidentally taint it. Now, they even look a little bit different in the cup, right? And as they should. Wow, look how less saturated that green is. And I know I put almost the same amount in there. Fallow blue green shade is not quite as concentrated as the fallow blue red shade. That's not us, that's how the actual color manufacturers make them, right? slightly lighter value see if I can get more on here so you can actually see what the color difference is here let's do what we did on our single drops to the card because you need a good representation of what this looks like now I know you don't see any green yet okay and you probably don't see any red and yet they are a different blue. This seems to be a little bit warmer. This seems to little be a little bit cooler. As soon as we add interference green to that green shade, almost immediately, it's gonna look like it's making a turquoise. And if I could add blue to this, but because we're playing with the red shade, right? I, I, my instinct is add interference violet, not red, because you know red and pur red and blue make purple, and so violet to me is probably going to be the prettiest with this. You can already see how the shades are responding to what we put in there before I even before I even stir it. Let me get these little spoons out here and get this thing mixed. Now when I wanted to make a wine, I think it was one of the first videos I did Instead of adding black to a red to deepen it, because black is a, is a shade, it takes, it removes color. Black removes color, it's not adding color. So when I wanted to take a red and make it into a wine, I kept adding fallow blue red shade to it to darken that red and get it into a wine tone. I will warn you though, I couldn't do it with the purely pigments. I had to use the vivid intense because remember, there are three mils per ounce. This is 25 mils per ounce. And so I had to use a fallow blue red shade in the Vivid Intense. And I, yes, Denise, I was working in an epoxy. So I was able to even add a few drops of Vivid Intense to my epoxy to get the wine that I wanted. But you can see what happens with that fallow blue red shade as soon as you add the interference violet. And the fallow blue green shade, of course it's gonna lend itself to colors that you would think of making water. Believe me, I use this a lot when I'm making all those beautiful turquoises in the prison pour that everybody loves. That uh, cerulean blue is made out of this fallow blue green shade and it's just stunning. But now that we do a swatch card on them, they're gonna look completely different and the mica, what it does is that interference mica bends the light and changes the way you see it. It just does. And so playing on the red shade, blue shade, it's like someone's got your back to the wind and say, I gotcha. I'm going to make you, help you make a really pretty color that would be great for water. I wish the, ma the manufacturers did that with every other color that they make, but they don't. So this is the mostly varnish. Actually, it's all varnish. There's no acrylic in it. It's just varnish, interference green, and the fallow blue, I'm sorry, fallow blue green shade and interference green. 
Make sure I keep my brushes separate. And see all that purple on there. You can immediately see what that fallow blue red shade does to the color. I like varnish because it seems to show true color even though there's lots of bubbles and stuff on it. Where acrylic paint stuff can get hidden and of course epoxy. <laughs> Nothing gets hidden in epoxy. Everything is seen in the clear. So I want you guys to start thinking about your colors. When you look at colors, what are you looking at? I'm, I'm probably going to create a monster here, right? John Niedermeyer always says he's, um, uh, is azure blue, it's a straight fallow blue. Let me show you. I did that one more time. I think that, oh, this is the regular azure blue, right? So to show them difference, a plain fallow blue versus a green shade and the red shade. Now, uh, when I'm making a Payne's gray, I like, or a dark, dark color. Um, now I opened up another door. Technically, Payne's gray, according to everything I've written, I, I've, I've read, is made with ultramarine blue and a raw sienna brown, okay? But there's now manufacturers that are taking fallow blue and adding black and calling it Payne's Gray. When I made mine, I actually intentionally use, I mix the red shade blue and the green shade blue together. We know that red and green makes brown, right? So I intentionally mix those two together and some of the regular fallow blue, you can do it with your azure blue, and you'll get a really, really, really dark color that's almost to a Payne's. I still, Avoid all the temptation to add black, even though there's companies that now put black in their paints gray, because to me, black takes color away. Adding color makes it richer. So I might add a little bit more green shade blue so I get more of a dirty blue effect that gives you that gray tone, that Payne's gray tone. Um, but I just kind of wanted to rip off the Band-Aid. So the next time I start talking about compliments, remember the two color primary colors that made that secondary color, like yellow and red makes orange. The complement is the primary color you didn't use to make that secondary color. Yellow and red, you didn't use blue. So blue is the complement to the orange. Yellow and blue makes green. And so red is the complement to the green, right? And the red and the blue mix purple. And the one primary color you didn't use was the yellow. That's okay, Terry. You missed my little color class today, but that's all right. And just so you can see yesterday's piece one more time so everybody can see yesterday's piece because Terry just came on. It's not completely dry, but did come out really Really, really, really nice. Yeah, we actually have 20, 30 people are on right now because we just got joined by Terry Lechner. So this is how it turned out. I cannot wait to resin that thing, Terry. Anyway, that's it for my little color basics today. I was going to do a pop quiz, but there was so much learning going on. I didn't think it was really fair to do a pop quiz right now. Um, you guys might want to watch this video a couple times and take some notes and write it down. We've just barely scratched the color, but I thought it was time to kind of rip off the Band-Aid and get into the basics of color mixing, right? And get this conversation started. And if I can put together some kind of Zoom class or uh, I wish there was, I wish the way that YouTube would allow us to all go into a class together and we could hear each other like on Zoom. Because I think it's time to start teaching this. Okay, people are making comments. Let me get my glasses on. See what everybody's saying. Uh, go into YouTube after posting. Do a thumbs up. Thank you. Thank you, girls. Thank you, Penny. Thank you, Janelle. Thank you, Sharon. Oh, my goodness. Hope you made it. So glad you made it, Hope. Uh, today was more about color mixing, but you can, you know, I know you're still tending to that beautiful new baby Arlo. 
And so brand new babies smell so good. <laughs> it smells so good. Anyway, guys, thank you so much. I love you guys. Oh my God, Loida. Loida, so nice to see you, sweetheart. So nice to see you. Anyway, I will see you guys on Tuesday and Friday and Saturday next week. Tuesdays and Fridays is 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, Saturdays is 9 a.m. like we did this morning. Remember, the stock up 40 code is for a few more days. We're trying to raise that capital so we can, you know, build out our warehouse and start doing the twinkling H2Os. And we're doing the special VIP membership cards. You're going to get all kinds of perks by joining the membership. I realize you guys have been supporting me and just to ask for more support may be a big ask. Uh, Sherry this morning said she was going to jump in, so that made my little heart happy. <laughs> anyway, guys, um, I appreciate you being here. I appreciate my the support. I love having you here. I love teaching and hugs and kisses. See you next time. Bye.